Hello and welcome everyone to the second day of student presentations of the 2021 Scientists in Parks Fellows cohort. If you are not aware what the Scientists in Parks Fellows is, it's an internship project where students, both undergraduate, undergraduate and graduate students have to perform a highly rigorous and difficult project for 11 weeks while at a national park. And upon completion, they earn a direct hire authority, which helps them hopefully get into employment with the national parks later on, but they also have to do an end of summer presentation. I wanted to just do a quick acknowledgement and recognize everybody that's involved in the Scientists and Parks Fellows admin team. My name is Jessica Johnston. I'm an education program coordinator with the Ecological Society of America. Uh, also, my boss, Teresa Murad, who's not with us today, but because we're in the middle of the ESA's annual meeting, is the Director of Education and Diversity Program with ESA. And then we have four awesome people that work on the SIP team from the MPS side. That's Kirsten Jarvis, Melanie Wood, Chelsea Biting, and Noah Angel. So I wanted to say thank you to all of them. Uh, with that said, this is really a show about the students today and their opportunity to showcase some wonderful work that they did in the park over the summer. So I am going to kick the screen and mic over to our uh, first SIP fellow, that is Andrea Salazar, and she works with Golden Gate National Recreation Area in Muir Woods and the surrounding areas. So I will stop sharing my screen now. And Andrea, the podium is yours. Thank you. Let me just um, <clears throat> share my screen. And um, is it looking good? Oh, <laughs> does it look good? Yeah, looks great. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrea Salazar. I'm a current undergraduate at UC Berkeley. Um, in the ecosystem management and forestry major. Now, before I officially begin today, I first want to acknowledge that I'm currently speaking from an occupying traditional coast Miwok territory. If you haven't done so already, I highly recommend you look up whose land you're on today. Today, I'll be talking about sustainable relations, human coyote coexistence in the wildland urban interface or WUI. I'm sorry, I got distracted because I'm seeing notifications of people coming in. Um, so this project okay. took place in the Golden Gate National Recreation Area in Muir Woods National Monument in Sausalito, California. So just a brief overview of what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, first, I'm gonna get into what the project is. I'll define terms like sustainable relations and share my own personal indigenous perspective. Next, I'll go into methods and data. And then finally, I'll talk about results and future implications. So the Coyote Project is a collaboration between multiple organizations, which looked at things like um, genetic analysis, diet analysis, and even worked on outreach, community outreach on um, coyotes. My focus in the project was looking at movement patterns in the marine headlands of the coyotes related to feeding issues and conditioning. So this project started in September, 2020, and it just wrapped up in May, 2021. So just a disclaimer, this was the first coyote tracking project in the headlands. Uh, there's still so much more work to be done. And so I'll just be sharing preliminary results. So what is sustainable relations? Sustainable is something you should usually refer to as good, long-term or environmentally related and relations meaning relationship. But how can we begin to move just beyond the ecological or biological definition of those words? How can we add more meaning? Well, we can start by being a good relative. So I started with myself. I began educating myself on the land around me, the Coast Miwok people and coyote. And as I was going through this research, I found this quote from Greg Sayers, who's the chairman of Federated Indians of Grant and Racheria. And he says, if we don't know its story, then we can't learn any lessons from it. So then I asked, who is Oye? What is their story? Oye is the Coast Miwok word for coyote. For the Coast Miwok, coyote is a creator. Creation occurred on top of Sonoma Mountain where he sat down and decided to create the world and people. But he is also significant for many other uh, Miwok groups as well. My friend Jesse, who's told me Miwok, shared with me the story of coyote or aseli, which is coyote in their language, and lizard, 
who got together and created humans. So why am I sharing this? Because I believe perspective and framing matters. If we begin to acknowledge all our relations, both human and four-legged, we can then begin to truly understand and practice sustainable relations because it includes everyone and it continues what these stories have done for thousands of years. And I also think that this relates to the topic of traditional eco ecological knowledge or TEK. It's not only about knowing how plants work or how to practice um, fire regimes, but also understanding that these stories are important to listen to and they're significant um, when being applied to our scientific practices. So coyote are native to North America and the San Francisco Bay Area. They're an important top predator because they maintain rodent communities and mesocarnivore populations like skunks and raccoons and ecosystems. So just to give you a better idea of where the project took place, uh, this is a satellite image of the Marin Headlands, which is located in the San Francisco Bay Area, just north of San Francisco after you cross the Golden Gate Bridge. And these circles here on the map show you areas of high concentrations of human activity. So the two main methods that we used in the project was GPS and radio telemetry. So the coyotes were humanely captured, tagged, and fit with GPS satellite collars, which you can see on this slide here, one of our coyotes is wearing. And they were all given uh, different colored ear tags to visually identify them. So this coyote here, her name is Red Red because she has red tags in her ears. And she's a female about 10 plus years. So unfortunately, out of the seven coyotes we captured, only four survived. The other three passed away as roadkill. This is a serious threat for coyotes and making a project like this that much more important to be conducted. So the callers released GPS information like coordinates and that was accessed online on a server, but they also were used for radio telemetry. So if you take a look at the picture on your left there, um, I'm very confused. <laughs> that was my first day and I had never used radio telemetry before. And there's my mentor, Bill, shout out to you for showing me how to hold the antenna correctly. So the callers release a radio signal, which the antenna picks up and then you can hear on the receiver as a beep. So if you're closer, it usually sounds louder. If you're further away, it's quieter. So the caller released geodata every day. They would release, um, every two hours, they would release a location point. So we would have 12 points per coyote each day. But they would also turn on for about six hours per week. And that was for the radio telemetry. So that's when we go out and physically track them. So one way you could represent this data is on a heat map. This is Red Red's heat map. Um, I'm sorry. This is a heat map of Red Red's location data uh, in the headlands throughout the project. Uh, the areas she visited the most are represented by the reddish yellow coloring there. So once we looked at the data, we confirmed what we already knew. She was hanging out at the Rodeo Lake roadside pullout, which is indicated there on the map where the green arrow points at that uh, red spot. Here she would beg for food, people would approach her, and in general, she'd spend more time near the road and cars, which we know can be dangerous. So to address this issue, we put cones out around the pullout, and this was to discourage her from begging, people approaching her, and of course, keeping her away from the road and cars as much as possible. So this is a bar graph of her location data at the pullout throughout the project. On the x-axis, we have the months, and the y, we have um, locations per day. And the big takeaway from this is it seems that after we put the cones out, uh, she was spending less time at the pullout. This seems like it was working, good news. But as we know how science goes and how life goes in general, there's always a million things going on in the background. So let's talk about the limitations. So first in September, uh, we were still tracking and calling Coyote. So we assume that she was spending less time there because she was trying to avoid that encounter again. And then after that, it seemed like she resumed her normal activities up until January, where we put the cones down. But there's also another uh, thing that could have been going on. So from December through May, um, you can see it was kind of starting to decline. That could have been due to her preparing to den or denning with pups or offspring. Denning is when um, an animal retreats in sort of hole in the ground, a hollow tree stump, or similar structure. So given everything I've just talked about, I have two recommendations moving forward. First is just to continue researching. This was just the first round of our uh, tracking and collaring and 
there will be more in the future. And, you know, that's important for us to get more data, to understand really what's going on and build that solid foundation. Next is analyze the limitations I just discussed. So was it really the cons that curbed her behavior? Was it that she was denning with pups? Or was there some other unknown element um, that we just didn't recognize? So why does this project matter? Coyote coexistence is something that occurs across all parks in the US. Um, anything that we learn here in this project, any solutions, any management strategies we use will most likely be applicable and adaptable to to their concerns as well. A huge thank you to the National Park Service, SIP Fellowship, and ESA for this wonderful opportunity. And a very special thank you to Bill, Mer Bill Merkel, Rachel Townsend, Katie Smith, and Lizzie Edson. And a huge, huge, huge shout out to all my community members, my loved ones, and my ancestors for continuing to motivate me and give me strength to do the work I do. Thank you. Um, also, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or ask. But here are some pictures of other projects I did. Awesome, fantastic, Andrea. And I think you've done a marvelous job at preliminary results. We all learn how you can only trust preliminary results, but so much. You do have a couple of uh, comments in the chat box. Sienna, do you wanna just unmute and ask your, or say your question? Yeah, I was just wondering if there's like societal conflicts over um, coyote predation in the area. I'm not sure if it's like a ranching region. And I saw that there was like an equestrian center over there. And I know that can be an issue in other areas in the US. Yeah, so um, here in the headlands, there's not really much of like ranching that I'm aware of. Um, we do have the stables there. But from what I've heard, um, they just hang out there and they don't seem like they're a threat. Uh, I know some uh, NPS folk that actually work at the stables and they've said, oh yeah, they just hang out there. They never mentioned that it was a, like they were viewed negatively there. Cool, thank you. And then you have another comment from uh, Vida. Vida, you wanna unmute and ask your comment or question? Yeah, I was just curious um, how you think scaling up the study, you know, tracking more coyotes might change your management recommendations or just like the conclusions of the experiment in the project? Yeah, you know, I was really interested in that too. You know, unfortunately, like you, I mentioned earlier, like um, three of our coyotes passed away. That's something that we can't really control. But I know that um, I was talking to Bill about there might be other groups like this group that we, so red red along with three others were like our coyotes we worked with um bill mentioned that there was uh, other groups of coyotes who hang out either more in the valley or maybe more towards like um the roads or like the freeway and so i'm i'm interested in like including all those groups and seeing like how how they interact in those spaces right like maybe the ones in the valley like we don't really you know it's just very different um, I think that's how, I think scaling up our sample size will show um, different strategies, approaches that we would have to take depending on how like they interact with the landscape and the people in the urban spaces. Awesome. Well, fantastic job, Andrea. Uh, always love to hear about our charismatic megafauna. Um, so good job. And you can stop presenting now. And we are going to kick the mic over to Kelsey Holleen. She did her work on uh, wildlife also in face of climate change at Saguaro National Park. So Kelsey, feel free to share your screen when you are ready. All right, so my name is Kelsey Halim. I'm a master's student at the University of Arizona, and I am also the SIP fellow at Saguaro National Park this year, uh, where I worked on a project called Wildlife and Climate Change in High Elevation Springs. I'm getting my slides to change. No, one slide won't move for you. Mm -mm. Maybe exit presenter mode and then go back into it. Sorry, guys. 
Uh, it's just part of the process. <laughs> He also won't let me like stop sharing. Huh. Great. <laughs> well, um, let me stop sharing for you. And then you can try it again. Zoom is not a perfect thing, so not a big deal. <laughs> Kelsey's got some great videos in her PowerPoint presentation, so it's overloading right now. <laughs> well, no, I hope it will hurt. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're good. All right, again, good. so I worked at Sawara this summer, uh, specifically studying the high elevation springs and wildlife use of them. Um, and so Sawara is a pretty unique park. It's actually split into two different districts, which sandwich the city of Tucson. Uh, so there's the Tucson Mountain District in the west, which um, represents more of your lowland desert, and then the Rincon Mountain District in the east. So the Rincon Mountain District contains the Rincon Mountains, which span from about 3,000 feet to the valley floor to almost 9,000 feet at the top. And so this is where all of the high elevation springs are located. And so at these higher elevations, there are a handful of historic springs that have always been pretty stable and reliable. Um, until recently, there's been a lot of climate change induced drought, as well as sedimentation from recent wildfires um, that have really dried up a lot of these springs. Um, however, since 2017, at least a dozen or so new springs have since been discovered. And so it's these new springs that now need to be studied to determine any kind of management decisions. So there's a lot of um, hiking and backcountry use of the park in this high elevation area. And so whether these springs need to be preserved for wildlife use or whether they can be opened up to visitors for filtration for hikers and backpackers is um, the management decision that needs to be made. And so to study these springs, we do a couple different things. Uh, we first start with spring assessments, which basically just describe uh, the stability, the water level, the vegetation, kind of any other identifying site characteristics. So we do an initial one at the beginning of the summer, and then we'll conduct a final one um, after the monsoon season. And we also deploy camera traps. So we have photo cameras, which capture motion, motion activated still photos, as well as vegetation time lapses, and then video cameras, which capture the wildlife behavior. And so for this project this year, we had these 10 springs um, located, or seen here on the map in the bottom, which are all located within that um, red border, the one at the top. And so between these 10 springs, we had about 24 cameras uh, dispersed between them. And so we tried to have a paired photo and video camera at each of these springs. Um, and so the cameras are still out. Uh, so this is still very preliminary data for this year. I mean, it's also still a relatively new project. Um, so last year was the first year that we were really trying to study these springs. Um, so this is still very much a field-based project. So within the last five weeks, we've hiked about 230 miles just trying to check these cameras. Um, so it's still very much a boots on the ground project um, and data management heavy as well. And so with the data that we do have, we are able to determine kind of who's visiting the springs the most at least. So within the last three months that the cameras have been out, we've gotten about 6,000 records. So this is um, kind of individual photos and videos that have been identifiable. And then almost um, at least 19 species have been detected so far. And so um, of the number of visits that these, um, that the wildlife are visiting these springs for, um, white-tailed deer followed by black bear are, have the highest detection frequency. And so because we have so many records, we obviously have a lot of really good footage. Uh, I don't have a lot of time today to show all of it, but I have a short uh, kind of highlights reel, kind of just narrating some of the, the more representative videos as well.
Right, so we were able to observe a lot of interesting kind of animal behaviors of them using these springs, and one of which was bear wallowing, uh, which mostly just um, means when a bear has a sit or a lie down in one of these spring pools and kind of just rolls around. Um, so prior to the season, it was noticed that a lot of these springs were actually conspicuously bear shaped in size. So it was um, anticipated this this, may be, this behavior may have been happening, but it was really uh, kind of validating to actually document it. Um, and so it's hypothesized actually that this could be a way in which the bears um, help to keep water at the surface, especially during the dry months and accessible for other wildlife to use. So we don't yet know that this is actually happening um, or that that is, is actually the case, but it would be something that's worth um, kind of continuing to look at in the future to track these specific springs uh, where this behavior was occurring to see if there's any kind of notable changes throughout the seasons. Now we also in, observed uh, spring use by endangered species. So the Mexican spotted owls and endangered species that the park has been monitoring, uh, mostly during uh, doing things like call point surveys. Um, but we've observed them um, using these springs as well. So last year there was only one spring which they were kind of frequently um, observed at, whereas this year there were three of them, three different springs. Um, so they're increasing their usage of the springs. And so this is just, um, even though it's not official um, kind of data points for these endangered species, it's really nice to get extra observations, particularly doing things um, in areas where they're not necessarily being um, observed doing, doing the, the actual like owl surveys. And so the last component of this project was tracking the hydro period of these springs. Um, so that's just the amount of time that the spring is wet. So these springs have seasonal, seasonal changes and the wildlife visitation reflects that. So earlier in the summer, it was a very, very dry year until we got uh, record breaking rain in July. So it went from very dry to very wet very quickly. And so the animal usage of these springs changed dramatically after that. Um, so we actually saw a decreased, um, a much, re much reduced kind of visitation after the rain started coming because just water was available everywhere. So there was really no need for these animals to congregate the springs. Um, anyway, so I generated these hydrographs mostly just as a visual representation of how these springs change over the season. Um, so some of them were very stable, but some of them were very variable as well. Um, so it kind of just, it runs the gamut. Um, and so this is just a really good way to kind of visually represent how, how these springs can change. And these could even be scaled up to include yearly data so we can compare between years and track changes as the project moves forward. And so again, this is still fairly preliminary research. Um, so we're gonna continue to monitor the springs using the wildlife cameras as well as collecting hydrologic data on the surface water at the spring. So that's gonna be taking measurements like surface area, depth, and getting kind of rough volume estimates. And then as well as using that time-lapse photography to maybe track the vegetation growth as the springs recharge. And then using the hydro period, or using that time-lapse um, photography to also get more fine scale um, estimations of the hydro period as well. And so with that, I had a really great summer. Uh, special thanks to everyone at Saguaro, particularly Nicole Gonzalez, my supervisor, as well as everyone else on the resource staff um, who helped with all of these trips, and as well as Jessica Johnson and the SIP program uh, for the opportunity. So anytime I can get paid to hike is a, is a good deal for me. So I'll take any questions. Awesome job, Kelsey. Uh, yeah, that you must be so in shape. <laughs> I like to think so, but I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I see a couple things popping up in the chat. Uh, Andrew and Vida's question, I'm going to kind of combine them. So Vida wanted to know how were these springs discovered? And then Andrew wanted to know whether or not the springs are rain fed. Yeah, so most of the, I'm going to answer the second one first. So most of the springs are actually, they're groundwater fed. So I think mostly they're usually recharged during winter rains specifically, but we just had like such a deluge kind of during the summer, which I, they usually don't recharge that much, but um, I think because it was so intense, all of a sudden they were able to recharge a little bit. And most of these are also located in drainages. So anywhere that there's just runoff, they will also kind of fill up, whether that's real recharge or not. And then, um, sorry, what was Vita's question? question? What was the first one? I was just asking how, how you all found the springs, the new oh, ones. So this was, um, so the, botanist at the park likes to do kind of drainage surveys um, for rare plants. And so a lot of these were discovered by him um, doing just kind of down drainage trips. And so there's just mostly intensive kind of vegetation mapping, things like that. So there were accidental discoveries for the most part. 
Those are the best kind. Those are the best kind. And then, um, so I guess that kind of connects to Jolie's question, which is that there were un there are underground water springs, um, and if they were separate or connected, like yes, these are all yeah, these are all separate um, individual springs. So some of them are in drainages, so they come out just out of the spring channel or out of the um, like the drainage channel, and then some of them are hill slope so they come kind of just more as a seep down like a, a flat hill slope um, so there's different kinds of springs um, that I, I can't really get into all of them right now but so some, most of these were kind of the, the the stream channel kind as well as hill slope and then some of them were seeps out of bedrock cracks you know things like that so they're all individual kind of disconnected but connected to the groundwater at least. Awesome. Hannah, do you want to unmute and ask your question out loud? Yeah, I was just wondering, great job, by the way, you were talking earlier about how one of the impetuses for doing this work was figuring out how to deal with backcountry management. And so I was just curious if there's been any research done on human effects on the springs and how what you found may influence backcountry management decisions. Yeah, so I don't know of any specific kind of research off the top of my hands, but or off the top of my head, but um, just based on like we don't get too intense visitor usage up there but there is the Arizona Trail does run directly through the mountains so it's mostly for through hikers that would be um, using the springs but it's just because they're mostly just really kind of delicate ecosystems that any kind of like really intense trampling there's a lot of rare plants at a lot of these springs too that you know only occur on like a single hill slope or something like that so it's really just trying to protect anything that's rare and unique at these springs but um, otherwise, it would just, you know, making sure that whatever decisions are made, that's not getting overused to the point where, you know, the trampling is the issue, so. Yeah. Okay, let's do one more question. Alexandra, do you want to unmute and ask your question to Kelsey? Yeah, sure. Um, great job, Kelsey. It's just super awesome to see you talk. Um, I had a question about the video review process. Uh, did you do all of this manually or do you have any sort of automated software for like detecting motion and stuff? Like it, it yeah, did you go through it all by hand? Yeah, it's all by hand. So I didn't go through, you know, all 6,000 records, obviously. So we have a, a dedicated camera guy at Saguaro. So that's Nick Perkins there on the screen. Um, he's the, the big camera guy, but um, so we'll take turns. Usually it's mostly downloading everything from the SD cards, kind of going through all the false positives. So deleting anything that doesn't actually have any animal in it and then uploading it to, so that's like mostly the database is just the files and then uploading it to a computer program called Photo Mechanic where you can go through and identify things like in batches and that makes it a lot easier. Um, but cool. no, otherwise that's, you know, that's, it's all mostly manual. Cool, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool project. Thank you so much, Kelsey. I know that I have some experience monitoring some videos and it is very time consuming. So a lot of patience required for that part of the project for sure. Um, watch all of them though. <laughs> yeah, especially when you have such <laughs> awesome uh, appearances there, that bear cup, let me tell you. Okay, well, thank you again. And now you can stop sharing screen and we will go to our next presenter. Uh, Sienna, you're welcome to start sharing your screen. And Sienna Wessel is going to be talking about sagebrush step restoration projects that she did this summer at Grand Teton National Park. Um, so let me change the spotlight to Sienna. I can find you. Okay, it's your show. Introduction. Just want to make sure everyone can see my screen okay. All yeah, right. it looks great. Fantastic. Thank you. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Deanna Wessel, and I'm a second year master's student of botany at the University of Wyoming, where I researched the response of sagebrush step plants to restoration efforts and environmental factors. And this summer, as a scientist and parks fellow, I've been really lucky to work with Grand Teton National Park. Um, on a relevant project where large scale sagebrush step restoration has been ongoing for over a decade. Oops, sorry, having some slight advance issues as well. Uh oh, oh, there we go. 
So the sagebrush steppe is a unique and biodiverse ecosystem that can be found across Western North America, where conditions are too dry for forest and too wet for desert. And that leaves shrubs in the genus Artemisia, which you see here, to create a top canopy under which more than 100 uh, native grasses and flower species thrive. And furthermore, more than 350 vertebrate animals depend on this ecosystem, some of which can be found nowhere else on the planet. And there are two main community types that can be found in Grand Teton, a dry grassy steppe and a mixed sagebrush bitter brush steppe association. Unfortunately, the steppe ecosystem has been reduced to about 45% of its original range due to a variety of threats, including invasive species that upend natural fire cycles, reduced snowpack as a result of climate change, and land use for oil and gas extraction. And as a result, the once widespread steppe has become imperiled. In Grand Teton, about one third of the park is designated as high quality sagebrush steppe, but a large tract of land was converted to hay fields by early Mormon settlers. And this 4,500 acre region known today as Antelope Flats is part of a stronghold of protected lands and a sea of oil and gas extraction that also happens to coincide with winter habitat for the threatened greater sage grouse bird and elk migration routes. And with the increasing threats to the steppe and the spatial importance of this landscape in mind, Grand Teton initiated restoration efforts in the hayfields in 2009, and that work is still ongoing today. However, restoration is a challenging process that requires piecing together an ecological puzzle. So it's important to step back and assess how things are going and make adjustments where needed, a process known as adaptive management. And Grand Teton has been monitoring restored and undisturbed sagebrush step communities, which you'll hear me refer to further as the reference. And that monitoring has been going on for over a decade in support of this process, but until now hasn't yet been summarized into results for management reasons. Furthermore, restoration is more than just science and practice. It's also dependent on public and internal support. And therefore, it's crucial that restoration projects include active efforts to communicate about the science being applied on the ground, as well as the importance of protecting biodiversity. And this is especially true in the national parks where these projects tend to be quite public facing and are not always well understood. So for example, last year in Grand Teton, there was damage caused to a recently seeded restoration site by a large group of visitors who used it as a track. And locals and visitors in the region often have a false assumption that the sagebrush step is not at risk or not worth protecting. With these challenges in mind, my summer fellowship focused on a diverse set of projects in the park, which applied science to improve land management and to enhance awareness of the need for restoration within the park. The field component of my work involved surveys of ephemerals or early spring flowering species which are key foods for wildlife and represent an important ecological group. Because these species are not captured in the typical monitoring timeframe, I developed and implemented a survey design and developed survey routes in our field maps to capture ephemeral diversity across sites of different ages, as well as the reference communities. And in this graph of the results, each species is represented by a unique color and more stacked colors essentially indicate higher diversity. And so what I found is that some ephemerals are colonizing early on after restoration and are found frequently and ubiquitously across all the sites, but that other species only occur in the undisturbed communities, suggesting that managers may want to seed and monitor these specific species to speed and track ecosystem recovery. Another big takeaway is that the diversity of ephemeral species doesn't follow restoration age linearly and is more site specific. So the next component of my fellowship focused on digesting a variety of analytical results into clear and management relevant summaries and recommendations. So this work involved taking complex plots like the one you see here and turning them into readable figures and communicate key points briefly in the form of a white paper that can be distributed to land managers, NPS leadership, and potential donors for the project alike. For example, I turned this complex dendrogram of hierarchically clustered species abundances into a simplified model of community recovery. 
And here I demonstrate that the clustering analysis showed communities following two main divergent paths of recovery as they mature. One which leads the majority of the restored communities to become invasion resistant and highly grass dominated. And the other which leads to a more complex structure of shrubs, grasses, and flowers, but also a significant quantity of exotic grasses. In order to understand the drivers of these divergent pathways, I summarize the results of multiple regression models, which assess the impact of multiple different factors on restoration outcomes. And we see that results are that the restoration outcomes are highly contingent on soil texture, seed mix design, and post-seeding weather. For example, sandier soils push communities towards targets such as similarity to the reference communities and higher species diversity. Heavy grass seedings decrease target wildflower abundance, and warmer winters post-seeding led to greater invasion and selection for more drought-tolerant species. However, these factors aren't actively considered in the current restoration planning and management process. So in light of this new information, my management recommendations include decreasing grass components of the seed mix, extra invasive management control after warm winters, and the development of a climate change mitigation strategy, strategy to use in conjunction with restoration for a couple of examples. On the science communication front, I engaged Jackson, Wyoming locals with the Antelope Flats Restoration Project through a half-day plant ID workshop. I led attendees through the basics of sagebrush step plant identification and also shared about work ongoing in the park to preserve sagebrush step biodiversity. And this event generated a list of trained, invested volunteers for future work like seed collection and plug planting. And for allowed for attendees to meet with Grand Teton staff and ask deeper questions about land management and stewardship in the region. Finally, I developed a social media campaign called Secrets of the Sage with the goal of increasing awareness of the value of the sagebrush step ecosystem, as well as the need for the Antelope Flats restoration project. And the culmination of this series will be the release of an interactive multimedia story map that I developed for the Grand Teton website. This story map guides viewers through the ecology of the sagebrush step, the history of cultivation in the region, and the ongoing restoration work. It also includes an interactive map of the restoration site with tour points that allow users to click and get information about restoration design, outcomes, and see photos of each site. And many of the images and information I've presented to you today are a part of this story map. And with that, I conclude my multifaceted fellowship journey to protect sagebrush step biodiversity. Thank you to the Grand Teton Vegetation Branch, especially my mentor, Laura Jones, the Ecological Society of America, and the Scientists and Parks Program for this once in a lifetime opportunity. And All right. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> <laughs> awesome job. Awesome job. Very big project for you uh, this past fall or summer, should I say fall? <laughs> It'll be carrying into the fall too, probably. All right, so we have some questions going on in the chat. Vida, you are a fellow plant person. You wanna unmute and ask your question directly to Sienna? Yeah, so if I understood correctly, you mentioned that there's some species which are only found in reference plots. So I'm assuming they, they prefer, high, they need higher quality habitat. And you mentioned that you might recommend reseeding with those species, but if they're only found in the reference plot, might that be an indication that they need, you know, fungal symbionts or pollinators, which aren't present in the early restoration stages? Yeah, no, that's a fantastic point. So it can kind of go both ways. I think what I meant to say is that if you want those species to enter the community, they may not, uh, if you want to speed recovery, they're probably not going to colonize on their own in those early stages, but you're right. There definitely could be some conditions um, that would restrict their, their survival within those communities. I think that's something we would have to research more. Um, but that sort of comes down to this question of, do we just seed what we know will work or do we work hard to try and figure out how to make certain species um, colonize the communities to speed recovery? So I think that's like a, a larger question than what that, that one ephemeral survey can answer, but a very, very good point to bring up. Awesome, I have a question too, Sienna. So um, you've talked about how there's higher likelihood of invasives coming in on those 
less cold winters or whatever. Have you sussed out what that threshold is in, in terms of temperature range that really will help management figure out when they need to, to act a little bit more aggressively after those window, winters have happened? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think about thresholds a lot and I think it's complex to think about how to suss out a threshold without um, doing like these kind of like partitioned models and things that weren't a part of that analysis. But you can you can kind of suss out where in you know the plot there's sort of this break in this transition. It seems though that for that specific relationship, it's like pretty gradual. So it doesn't seem like there's this like, solid threshold that comes out of the data um, at this point in time, but I assume that it does exist. It's just something that we might have to apply a different structured model to, to find. Very good, very good point. Um, and I, I actually wanna ask one more question because I'm an insect person and I know that you, you are getting a little pushback from the community in that area in terms of how important stage sagebrush step restoration is. Have you all implemented the importance of pollinators as part of your science outreach program um, to kind of woo the people in from a different angle, so to speak? Yeah, I love that question. I definitely think that that's something on our minds. And I didn't, in my social media campaign, specifically focus on pollinators, but I did highlight this really cool moth. You'll have to look it up because it wasn't in my presentation. But the sagebrush sheep moth is highly dependent on the sagebrush ecosystem. It can't really live without sagebrush um, for its larva. And so, you, yes, I think using charismatic, both megafauna and insects are a part of that strategy, and that will continue on beyond my time. There are also, there's there's also a collaboration going on with some pollinator research in this area that my mentor, Laura Jones, is currently strengthening. So more on that to come in the future. Yeah, yeah. I feel like the pollinator buy-in is so big these days. Um, it's, you have to use whatever angle works, right, for restoration. Absolutely. Okay, well, if you have any more questions for Sienna, you're welcome to put them in the chat, and I'm going to move forward into the pre the next presenter, but fantastic job, Sienna. Thank you so much. That was really, really informative, especially from somebody like me, an East Coast girl who has no idea what it sagebrush step even is. Come to love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd you. love to come visit and check it out one day. All right. So next on the roster, we have Andrew Birchhill. And he is going to talk to us about birds at Isle of Royale, even though Andrew is technically an entomologist. Um, so he got to do a fun project this summer, not related to anything he's doing in terms of his program. Andrew, feel free to take over the screen share when you're ready. I would just say uh, calling me an entomologist is a, is a, compliment and probably a slight exaggeration <laughs> but i i aspire to be an entomologist okay let's see nonsense you are an entomologist you have arrived you just don't know it yet <laughs> the only the only insects i know anything about are social insects so that's more than most people <laughs> that's more than most Thank all right you. yeah your screen looks great and you're good to go when you're ready okay so yeah, my name is Andrew Birchall. I am going to talk about bird communities across the Great Lakes region. Okay, so just a bit about myself first. I'm an ecologist at ASU. Um, I love talking with my hands, um, but you are probably not gonna be able to see that online. Uh, I also uh, am obsessed with data and I really like doing field work and I love talking about these things to other people as well. As for kind of my career aspirations, I hope to be a scientist with the government and, you know, perhaps obviously, but hopefully with maybe a land management agency uh, doing some uh, natural resource work. But let's just jump into my project. We are talking about birds in the Great Lakes. It turns out essentially the Great Lakes are like spring break for birds. Um, you, it's a huge hotspot for breeding migratory birds. So birds like this beery over here will come as far as southern Brazil, but we have birds from Mexico, Central America, 
uh, Southern America, South America. Um, there's a lot of birds that come up to the Great Lakes. But as you may already know, uh, recent research has suggested that bird populations in North America are just being decimated. Uh, so like 30% decrease in birds since 1970. So that is a horrific catastrophe that's going on. And it's probably important to know more about this. Uh, luckily, there are people who are doing this. So especially in the Great Lakes region, there are these really dedicated volunteers who go through these trails that you can see below. For example, these are the trails on Isle Royale. Every year they stop at these points and they just listen to birds. Yeah, so essentially they're just identifying birds by their calls, which is pretty crazy that you can just do that. Um, but these are experts and uh, they get how many and identify to what species there are. And so we have an idea of which birds are where uh, over sometimes a really long time series. For example, Isle Royale has been doing this for uh, 25 years. And so, but even better, um, there's the Great Lakes Monitoring Network started in 2000. Uh, it's an inventory and monitoring network that kind of covers the Great Lakes region. Uh, there's nine different parks that have uh, joined together and they're all since 2011 participating in this breeding bird survey. Um, but some of them, of course, have been doing it since like 1982. Uh, and so quickly, I'm just going to go through these parks uh, just so you have a nice big idea of what they are. Uh, first, Isle Royale, it's the best park. You don't need to say any more than that. Uh, but we also have Apostle Islands. Um, Grand Portage, uh, the Mississippi National River, Pictured Rocks, St. Croix, Sleeping Bear Dunes, uh, Voyageur, and not Indiana Dunes. Uh, Indiana Dunes uh, collects the data in a different format and it's kind of weird, so we're just going to pretend they don't exist right now. So my question is pretty simple. How are the birds especially these breeding migratory birds, changing over time and across and between these parks. But before we kind of get into that, we have to say, why is any species found anywhere, right? Uh, it's, it's pretty basic, but essentially we're, there's some interplay between uh, what the species does and the qualities of the environment. So like species niches would be the word. So for example, if there are a lot of moose out there eating all the shrubs, you might expect to find fewer shrub nesting birds. Uh, that is a hint to my other project that I did about moose, which is really cool, uh, but we're not going to talk about that today. So, yeah, so essentially I got this data. I got the birds we find and where are they, got some environmental information about those locations, and then uh, information about the birds and who they are and their traits. I got this data from the monitoring network. I got it from published papers and different park surveys over the years. Essentially, I got this data and I smushed it all into this thing called Hierarchical Modeling of Species Communities, or HMSC. It's this crazy, very complicated statistical model um, that's really cool, uh, but we don't need to get into the boring details about that. So essentially, I'm just going to give you some highlights. Um, I ran a lot of different models, and I can give you some of the highlights about uh, what I found. Not everything, but just some cool stuff. So first of all, we can look at differences between these parks. So on this x-axis, I'm just going to have a bunch of different parks. And on the y-axis, we're looking at what proportion of the birds are migratory. So interestingly, or perhaps not interestingly, um, there are migratory birds that make up the vast majority of most of these birds, which kind of makes sense. However, Mississippi uh, National River Recreation Area has significantly less, probably because it's in an urban area or more developed, and, or maybe it's just not a stopover point for these migratory birds. Same sort of thing on the x-axis here, different parks. 
But on the y-axis, we can also look at things like how many of these birds breed in wetlands, right? Uh, in that case, uh, sleeping bear dunes is kind of the winner. Uh, it is just a little strip of land right on uh, lakes and wet environments, so that kind of makes sense. But we can look at this for essentially any sort of bird characteristic that we care about. But perhaps even cooler, we can look at these over time too, not just between parks. So uh, we're looking just at the time, you know, over time and look, looking at species richness. So how many species can you find in kind of a, a given plot? So awesomely, St. Croix is one of these parks that is increasing in species richness over time. However, other parks like Voyager are actually decreasing. We also have parks that have kind of pretty high, relatively constant species richness, and some that just have relatively low species richness, like Isle Royale. Um, also, we can look at individual species, of course, between any of these parks over time. I realize now that um, I've only included one picture of a bird in this entire talk so far, and among ornithologists, I think that can get you shot. Uh, so here's another picture of a viri. It's the one I talked about earlier. And we can look at, you know, how likely it is to be in a, a spot over time. So awesome, you know, you can say, oh, look, it's increasing a lot in St. Croix and just there's a moderate increase in Voyageur, for example. But you can do this with many, all the species you want. Uh, this is kind of the, maybe the most important thing and it's going to be the most confusing plot. But we can also ask things like, hey, this national kind of decrease in bird populations, is it also kind of mirrored in these parks? Um, and so it's going to look really nice because it's going up and it's a positive slope, but that's really the percent of birds that have high growth rates over the last 25 years. So as some bird species kind of decline, the average growth, growth rate will increase because we'll find more of the common birds. So uh, even though it looks like a positive thing, in this case, it's really just saying that the parks and the birds in the parks are not immune from kind of these continent-wide trends in bird populations we're seeing, which is pretty important. So um, yeah, so we, you can find a lot of different things with the, these models. And I just went into a few details about how the, the parks are different or how you can look at, you know, uh, wetland breeding birds, shore birds, you know, uh, individuals or kind of trends and compare them, you know, with national averages. Uh, so, but really the takeaway is that HMSC could be a really, really helpful tool for park management in general, uh, especially like in my moose pod project, I really throw in more environmental data and that's really easy with remote sensing. We can throw in, you know, temperature, average precipitation, um, land use, land cover, all these different things. And you can also predict into the future too. So you can say, okay, in this climate change scenario, what do we expect the birds to do? Or with this sort of deforestation, what do we expect to happen? So it seems like it's a really awesome tool. But also, of course, I have to thank the people that helped me. Lynette and Jared uh, were incredibly important. Jared's the uh, collaborator we have at Michigan Tech, and Lynette is the scientist on Isle Royal. Uh, also, of course, I have to thank Jessica Johnson and, uh, sorry, Johnston and the entire ESA staff. They've been incredible and in doing everything they can to make this a good experience for us. I wish I could talk about the moose stuff, but I don't have time. So. Thank you so much, and if you have any questions, I would love to hear them. All right, awesome job, Andrew and it's hard to tell that you're not a bird person with all this bird uh, data that you just spit out at us. So we do have some questions that rolled into the chat during your discussion. Um, Jolie, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, I was just wondering if you have any insight into if there's like a different driver in the Great Lakes region than you were talking about the national, you know, decrease in birds. Do you think there's a specific cause? Like you mentioned the one park was more human populated or is it climate change? Is it invasive species like cats or do you think it's just everything altogether? Yes. So there are a lot of 
bird. And some birds, of course, are not included at these lists. Especially, essentially, volunteers have to be able to see them and more importantly, hear them. So if the bird's not singing um, or it's maybe more secretive, we don't really get data on it. Um, but uh, the, one of the reasons I think that these birds so closely follow these like continent-wide tr trends is because they are migratory. So like, you know, they breed here, but they spend the rest of the year, you know, going through and living in a different country, right? So unless every country that they kind of go through takes precautions to protect them, you know, they could just be, you know, there could be no habitats where they live during the winter or they could be predated or, you know, um, so I'm, I'm not really sure the continent, why are all the birds disappearing? That's uh, a question that's a little bit beyond me, but I mean, probably, of course, habitat loss, you know, feral cats, the, the typical kind of thing that we ascribe to decreases in bird populations. Um, but uh, in particular, the reason why we see such a close correspondence between those trends and in the park is probably because these birds love migrating here. And there's a lot of kind of coastal effects that happen with lakes this big that kind of uh, attract them or present good breeding grounds for them. And so of course, maybe the Mississippi River just doesn't have um, the same kind of like coastal effects. Maybe. If that answers your question. <laughs> Yeah, also to, to that point, Andrew, we also don't know a whole lot about their wintering grounds, right? So there could be reasons that we're seeing reductions in migratory birds because of the fact that we, perhaps their wintering grounds are degrading as well. Yeah, it's, um, it's crazy. I mean, people know a lot about birds, a lot more than they know about ants for a lot of things. But um, uh, just recently, some, there was these, these swallows, like cliff swallows, I think they're called, and no one knew where they wintered. And so they put like a GPS tag on one of these guys. And it turns out, you know, they migrate all the way down to somewhere in like Chile and it's behind some waterfall. It's like they only live behind waterfalls on these cliffs or something, which is pretty crazy. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to deal with things that migrate that far. Yes, yes, and definitely hard to track something uh, that's very tiny, right? Because they yeah. can't have like very heavy backpacks. Uh, so there's a couple of comments or questions in the chat from uh, Vida and Alexandra, specifically talking about your uh, skills in terms of statistical analysis and data analysis. Um, and one is, what R package did you use for this HM at HSMC, or am I saying it right, uh, model? And then also, what recommendations or advice do you have for biology students that are hoping to get better at statistics and data analysis? Okay, well, the, the package is really easy. It's just called HMSC, um, but it is a steep learning curve. Essentially, uh, that's all I did the entire summer was um, learn how to use this thing. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's cool. And if you're doing some sort of kind of community ecology thing, it might uh, be worth doing it for your own research. Um, if certain, by the way, if you ever do want to use it, um, and I would just Google it and learn some more about it. But if you do want to use it, talk to me. I spent all that time learning and I want to be able to use it to help people. So I just hit me up later if you end up using it. But in terms of uh, stat skills, um, uh, of course, you know, taking classes is good, but uh, it, and of course, everyone should like learn a programming language like R, but uh, a lot of it is just kind of you learn it when you need to use it. Uh, so if you know, if you have a, a friend who's good at stats, um, you kind of take the problem to them and, uh, you know, they might tell you, oh, you might, might want to use this. And then you spend a few days, you know, reading books or learning, uh, learning how to use that. Because there's so much stats. It's not, I would say it's not worth your time learning stats you aren't going to use. Yes, yes. Uh, practice makes perfect. Stats definitely doesn't come naturally to a lot of biology students, particularly ones who love to be out in the field and aren't super into the mathematics portion of their passion, I would say. Um, 
maybe we should have an SIP fellows uh, coding boot camp one of these times where we can all get together and share our knowledge. That would be really fun. Okay, so that's it. Thank you so much, Andrew. You did a fantastic job. You can stop sharing screen now. And we are going to gear up for our last but not least presenter, Sana Saeed who came all the way back home from Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And she's going to talk a little bit about developing climate change education curriculum for high school students. So Sana, you're, when you're ready, go ahead and put your presenter view on. OK. Um, also, for some reason, there is like construction happening outside, of course. So sorry if you hear that while I'm presenting. <laughs> Sounds great on our end so far. OK, awesome. Um, are we good with seeing my screen? Yep, you're ready to go. All right, awesome. Oh, sorry. OK, so hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm Sana Syed. I'm currently a PhD candidate at the University of Notre Dame, and I'm really excited to share the work I did with the Scientists and Park program over the last few months. So my presentation kind of switches gears from the previous ones because um, my project was concerned with how we can take all of this um, really great on the ground research that's happening at the national parks and communicate it to students in a way that not only educates them, but also inspires action from them. So this summer, I worked within the education division at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park to build a high school climate science curriculum that focused specifically on the island of Hawaii. Using my experience as a high school science teacher and as a graduate student studying how human nature relationships can influence the way we relate to and treat wildlife, I developed lesson plans that take students on a journey to connect them to their land and foster a sense of responsibility to preserve and care for it. So because it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, Hawaii is particularly susceptible to climate change impacts like sea level rise, coastal erosion, and ocean warming and acidification. Hawaii Island, the southernmost of the Hawaiian Islands, is the site of two active volcanoes that make up Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, where I work this summer. This island is ecologically diverse and unique as a result of this active volcanism, which means climate change's forces have unique impacts here. By highlighting the uniqueness of their local ecologies and weaving in cultural narratives and history, this curriculum offers an opportunity to educate students on climate change while simultaneously instilling a sense of belonging and responsibility to the land. So before I started actually building the lesson plans, I dove into the current climate science research that's happening on the island and importantly, hiking around the park to build my own connections with the ecology. I spoke with various scientists and specialists across the park and learned about native Hawaiian culture and connections to the park's lands. While conducting hikes, I was able to better understand how students might observe the landscapes, vegetation, and other wildlife to get a sense of the uniqueness of the island's ecology and a sense of their ecosystem's health. For one hike, I walked along the edge of the primary caldera of the Kilauea volcano and through an area with multiple sulfur vents. These vents are produced by cracks in the surface where sulfuric gases from the volcano's magma are released. Though this walk was only about one to two miles, the presence of vegetation drastically changed during the walk, for obvious reasons, and it's a little bit hard to grow near all that sulfur dioxide. With a bit more observation and some research, I learned that lichen, which is pictured here, are particularly sensitive to sulfur dioxide and other harmful emissions, making them an effective bioindicator of air quality. So I crafted a lesson where students track the presence of lichen through this hiking trail as they learn about volcanic and climate change related emissions. After comparing their tally of lichen presence near the sulfur vents versus farther away from the vents, students discuss and hypothesize why these drastic differences occur using what they learned about air quality and its impacts on biodiversity. This lesson also weaves in issues of environmental justice as areas that are downwind of the volcano are lower income communities that are particularly affected by poor air quality from the volcanic and other emissions across the island. Another lesson centers on wildfires, which are a major consequence of climate change that we see occurring more and more frequently across the island and across the world. While hiking, students explore the characteristics of the vegetation along the trail that might contribute to flammability or survivability during wildfires. 
I was actually able to test this lesson with our youth rangers and using their observation skills, they pointed out properties such as wetness, surface area, leaf waxiness, and breeziness as potential contributors to different vegetation types spreading, sustaining, or surviving wildfires. What these observational lessons do is give students the tools to recognize the health of their surrounding ecosystems and connect it with broader global patterns while simultaneously reconnecting students with their scientific intuition. This intuition is a vital piece of feeling connected and committed to nature. The lessons all conclude with activities dedicated to solutions or improvements from community education or resilience scenarios to demanding environmental justice from local governments to things like beach cleanups. The students synthesize their observations and analyses from the lessons to figure out how they can fight against climate change both personally and more broadly. Pictured here on the left are the youth rangers playing a community resilience board game where they had to brainstorm ways to protect their neighborhoods from a spreading wildfire but by deciding how to best allocate their community resources. A post-game discussion revealed that the youth rangers believe that the most powerful way to build community resilience to climate disasters is by fostering a strong sense of community responsibility and a knowledge of land. But how can we do that? A common challenge that's often cited with science and climate change education is getting students connected with and committed to their environments and fighting to preserve them. It's important to note, however, that many cultures across the world, especially indigenous, indigenous ones, don't necessarily have this challenge. Traditional ecological and non-Western scientific knowledges strongly value sharing history and ancestral knowledge as a way to pass on a connection to nature and a drive for science. In Native Hawaiian culture, the sharing of mo'olelo or legends and the performance of hula are both storytelling devices that teach and preserve cultural understandings of what we gain from nature emotionally, spiritually and physically. The, the addition of cultural understandings of place is a key component to effective climate change education if our goals include enacting change and instilling a connection to land. Given the history of the national park system, particularly the displacement of indigenous communities, we have a responsibility to prioritize and value traditional ecological knowledge, especially given its effectiveness in environmental action. Many Native Hawaiian values are connected to sustainable living, caring for and listening to the land and being stewards of the earth for future generations. Hawaii Volcanoes National Park has a unique opportunity to share more than just really groundbreaking climate change research, but also wisdom and inspiration and connection to land. We should certainly be using all of the tools that we have to combat climate change. So by incorporating these Hawaiian values into the curriculum, we hope that students receive a blend of cultural and scientific knowledge that inspires a lifelong commitment to fighting against the strongest force of environmental change of our generation. So the curriculum that I worked on will be available on the park website this fall and can definitely be adapted, adapted across parks or at home. Um, so finally, I just wanna say thank you to my park supervisor, Jody the SIP coordinators and the staff, especially Jessica Johnston, happy birthday, um, my awesome coworker Kailani Haney and the Parks Interpretation Division. And also thank you all for attending. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks. Awesome, thank you so much, Sana, and you outed me. <laughs> I appreciate it, fantastic presentation. Um, I see a comment from Sienna. Sienna, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, so I just, yeah, I just wanted to say a very creative and effective lesson plans and they're really out, gorgeous outdoor setting, right? I think this place-based education is so, so important and valuable. Um, I wanted to know if you thought, if you either did develop or thought about suggesting the development of some sort of confirmatory assessment to gauge whether students were taking away the learning objectives and the values that you're hoping to instill. Um, so plenty of the lessons um, and or suggest post activities within the classroom that um, involve like creating deliverables like infographics um, or letters to legislators and things like that, um, kind of as a an informal type of assessment, um, but there aren't any kind of like formal assessments that uh, really work toward figuring out um, yeah, whether the, the learning objectives and values are, are really instilled, but. That's a good question. And it would be interesting, definitely maybe another project for another intern to develop some assessments, some formal assessments uh, to make sure that the curriculum that you're developing uh, 
it's working, right? Because at the end of the day, that's what we want is a, a science-based society, or at least a society that believes in our science. Um, and then I guess I had a question because I was under the impression that this curriculum was being developed for high school people, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's going to be taught at the national parks, is that correct? Yeah, so the intention is for uh, like high school groups that are coming into the park to have these lessons done. So they're all based on like guided hikes or some of them take place on beaches since um, there's a lot going on with like coastal erosion and ocean acidification. Um, and so, yeah, they're meant to be conducted like with the parks. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I wish this would just be so lovely if we could find a way to get that curriculum actually you know, in the high schools themselves, especially because I'm assuming not all high schools in Hawaii have the opportunity to go to Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, but that's just dreaming big, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, if you want to ask a chat or two, a uh, question in the chat or two for Sana, you're more than welcome to, but I am going to wrap up this for today. I want to say thank you so much to all of the incredible presenters. Um, you guys did a fantastic job. I am so proud to have gotten to meet all of you and watch you do your presentations and grow as you have come through the program this summer. So don't, the interns, if you hang back, that would be great. But for the folks that have joined us to watch our presentations, I just wanted to mention that we do have three more interns that will be presenting uh, later this fall, their project, or later this summer, their project started a little later than everybody else, so it wouldn't have been fair to make them present stuff that they haven't figured out yet. So if you can mark your calendars, and I'll share the schedule in the chat box for the last three present presenting um, on August 24th at 1 p.m. Eastern, you're welcome to join us. We would hope to see you there. Um, and a special thanks to all of those that came to uh, support this project or support this program. It seems like they're doing a lot of great work and I'm very, very proud of these individuals. And if you missed any presentations at all yesterday or today, you can check out our YouTube um, playlist, which showcases all of the interns projects that have been presented thus far. But with that being said, thank you to the students. Thank you to the mentors. I know this is a lot of extra work for everyone um, and I couldn't be prouder to be a participant in this. So uh, with that, thank you and I'm gonna stop recording.